Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where we put our property experts to task answering your questions. And joining me today is Nick Gewitt of the Property App. Welcome to you, Nick. Thank you. And Dave Ford, who's been with us several times before, project manager and um, consultant to the construction industry. Happy with that? Very happy. Good. Okay. Well, it's good to see you both and thank you for coming in. Nick. Uh, I have a portfolio of buy to let properties and wish to expand it with quite restrictive legislation being considered by the government here. I wonder whether making my investment north of the border, i.e. in Scotland, the returns may be better. Do the panel have any advice on this or perhaps have a view even? Um, I'm not sure if you would say better. Uh, I think it's easier to build a portfolio because the properties are a lot cheaper. Uh, you get a lot more for your money. So yeah, we have a lot of inquiries from people, um, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, maybe Dubai, you know, other Arab countries. Um, and you get a lot of people from London who would like to build a portfolio and they just can't afford to. So they, they, they even move up as far as, you know, the Northeast, the Newcastle, Durham, those kind of areas. But we get a lot of people coming to Scotland to invest. Um, service accommodation is really good. A lot of areas in Scotland as well. So people might, build those kind of portfolios, invest their money into those markets. Yeah, the returns um, are probably similar to what you would get. Um, but yeah, you get a lot more for your money, a lot easier to, to buy What sort of them. return would you look at on a typical buy-to-let portfolio? Um, I, t I mean, most of the stuff that we were doing uh, was, was flips. But, you know, on a good buy-to-let, um, you know, you were maybe making five hundred pounds on a two or three bedroom flat, but obviously with interest rates all going up, that's maybe cut down to two hundred pounds now. Um, so yeah, it all depends what the interest rates are, what you've paid for the property. I mean, it's very, very strong rental market in a lot of areas in Scotland and most areas. Um, obviously, short of houses as well, same as the, as the rest of the UK. Uh, but I think the big attraction for people is, you know, you can pick things up for 50,000, 100,000. Um, whereas, obviously, if you're in, in London, you're probably starting at 400,000 before yeah. you can start looking at something. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously well, just I mean, the kind of bare I mean, minimum. Just look, looking out of the window here, I mean, I'm just looking across the road there. I mean, one bedroom flats in that block are now yep. starting at 800,000. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how you do it. And a lot of buy-to-let people are saying, look, you know, the service charges have gone through the roof with the heating and energy costs for, you know, comfort cooling and that sort of thing. And, you know, they're, they're actually running in negative equity, yep. even with the higher rental rates. Yep. So, yep. so difficult, difficult times. Are you seeing much of this, uh, Dave? I know quite a few people who, who invest north of the border. Someone was telling me, um, I forget the exact figures, but uh, they were they were making about four four hundred and fifty pound a month um, somewhere at Glasgow, I think it was on the outskirts, and they said I'm not really making much more than that on my properties in London. The difference is twenty five percent of a quarter of a million pound flat in London, as opposed to twenty five percent of a seventy five yeah. hundred grand flat in Glasgow, it's just a no-brainer. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I, I, I suppose industry in Scotland has picked up tremendously over the last years, hasn't it? We've done a lot of investment. Oh, yeah, yeah, in terms of property mm. investment, yeah. Which means you've got good tenants. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the house, the rental market is very, very strong. It far outstrips uh, the, the, the demand. Um, so, yeah, there's just the places like Glasgow, uh, Edinburgh, and all the surrounding areas, uh, right across that central belt, yeah, the demand is very, very high. Yeah. And what about you, you, your rail infrastructure in Scotland? Is that is that quite healthy? Yeah. Um, we, we have a tiny little... Uh, toy looking underground in Glasgow but yeah the actual train uh, infrastructure yeah it's pretty comprehensive you can go most places uh, you know ease of commuting is very important isn't it especially when you're looking at buy to let if you yeah. follow if you follow the areas that are being invested in and and is good travel facilities yeah. to it I mean yeah. that makes a huge difference yeah you've got to have the good schools and the infrastructure you know different shops but yeah, the, the public transport's always a big one as well you know if, if there is a place that's maybe not got great uh, transport um, it's, it's probably uh, lowers your, your rental income yeah although do you know what the, this business of following the stations I mean Dave you must have seen this over the years being a London man 
Um, people chase stations when they want to, to, to invest in buy to let. And I've never really seen it work yet. I, I'll cross rail. I know people who bought places. As soon as the route was announced, yeah. they bought places. And by the time Crossrail was finished, those properties had tripled in value. Really? Yeah. Mm, wow. I mean, the, I, a lot of. I, I mean, there's been a lot of fuss about this Elizabeth line that we've got, and you know, I, having been on it, I suppose it does work quite well going across London. But I'm not sure it's had the economic impact that it was hoped for. And if you balance that against the cost of constructing it, I don't know. I, I think the whole idea was to provide extra capacity. When you talk about economic impact, the, the idea of it was with but, it, the trains were just so packed. But now we've got the problem. They're saying HS2, HS2 is going out to sort of Wormwood Scrubs area and not coming into London. And people have to go on the Elizabeth line, which will create acute congestion on that alone. Oh, uh, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's your favourite subject, HS2, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I don't. I, 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 could, I could go on. <laughs> Perhaps these things were best left to constructors rather than governments, eh? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Perhaps so. OK, that's fine. Uh, Dave, um, your question. The new Building Safety Act came out in 2022. How will this affect people carrying out new build projects? Is there anything that developers need to know from a legal point of view, or is everything the responsibility of the actual builder? Will this add additional cost to developments? Does this only apply on big construction projects? Okay, so the Building Safety Act 2022 is a 260 page document. That I can't go into now. <laughs> um, I'll have a flick over it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in essence, it was brought out as a result of the Grenfell Tower disaster and the Hackett report into that. Now, if you've ever read that, you will see that uh, the reasons for that fire and the construction work on it was nothing short of, of criminal. Those, those people were murdered. Um, they uncovered people falsifying quality assurance documentation, um, falsifying their qualifications. Uh, the testing at the laboratories was falsified. There was backhanders there, there were corners cut. It was criminal. So this is uh, why the Building Safety Act has come out. Now, it is predominantly to do with fire. However, it does have implications for the verification of materials being used, but I won't go into that. People think it's only for major projects over 18 metres or seven floors. If you're doing a development that big, you will now have to deal with a new body called the Building Safety Regulator, which is the HSE. So you're not dealing with building control, you're dealing with the HSE. But the Building Safety Act applies to everyone. If you're doing Probably standalone new build houses, I'd say no. But if you're doing commercial to residential, perhaps you're, you've got an old hotel, four storeys away, you're doing into flats, anything like that. What it does is it can't, every residential dwelling, let's say, there's a potential for fire and there's already certain regulations in place for that. but. What this does, it specifically brings out a legal responsibility for the client or the owner or the person putting the money up to make sure that the fire strategy is followed. It goes right to the top. It got, Before you could say in the event of an incident, you say, well, look, I had an architect, I had a project manager, I had a consultant, the, the builder's supposed to know what he's doing. It, how can I be expected to know? Now the law puts that responsibility on you. So it will introduce additional costs. You will need to have a fire consultant involved and you will also need to have a competent person that you'll need to pay to make sure that whatever the fire consultant puts in their fire strategy, that the correct design is brought into place, the correct materials are on site, they are installed correctly and that's called the golden thread, right? All that information. 
There's a, a legal responsibility to keep that for 12 years. There are criminal penalties for not abiding by it. Um, it's being updated on the 1st of October this year, and that will increase the maximum fines from three grand to unlimited fines and up to two years imprisonment. Mm. So if you're a developer, you're buying an old office building, you turn it into 10 flats, you'll need to do all this, you'll need to collate this information and it's down to you. You, you, you cannot sign away this responsibility. When it's completed, this information must be in place. So I would say to any developer, what data retention strategy have you got as a company? Have you even got one? You know, mm. this needs to be kept. It needs to be passed on if you're selling it. And leaseholders, if you've already, you own a building and you're doing some work, now all this falls on you. So it's not the responsibility of the builder. It doesn't just apply to big projects. The serious consequences. I think if somebody said to me, developing at the moment, I'd go put that away <laughs> real quick. Anyway, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break and we'll be asking uh, Nick and Dave more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and we're asking Nick Geert and Dave Ford more of your questions. And Nick. The UK property market has long been supported by foreign investment in property. Do the panel think that with dropping prices and pretty flat predictions for the economy, this investment will continue? I don't know what I don't know what your percentage of, of foreign investment is in Scotland, but I know I, I was involved in a couple of buildings down here, and foreign investment was about seventy five percent of the of, of of the purchase numbers. Yeah, I couldn't tell you exact numbers, but I would be keen to know. But um, yeah, I mean, as I say, there's so many people ask about investing in Scotland, whether it's, we've got obviously got a lot of scenic places where people can do holiday lets and service accommodation. But yeah, just in general, it's, it's a good place to invest. We get lots of inquiries from, from people overseas. Um, and I think when there's a recession or there's you know any kind of um, something going on in the market, you know the, the interest rates going up, people wanting out a property, it's always an opportunity. So if you've got funds or, or you've got external funders and investors, it's a good time to buy. And, and people who've got the money know that. Um, mm. So you get you get the regular people want to leave property. You know they get worried about the interest rates, but you get people who've got funds, who are serious investors. They they start snapping the properties up. Yeah. The lower the prices go, the, the more they want to buy. Yeah. Um, but you do need to be careful that you're buying in the right areas. You know, you're buying low and you know the, the, the price is going to increase a lot in value over the years. So in effect, it's almost a recession can create a boom, can't yep. it? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And it's, yeah. you hear all the money people talking, you know, like your Grant Cardone's and Robert Kiyosaki's, and you know, they, they, they buy en masse during recessions. It's the best time to buy. Um, but you do still have to be careful. You need to make sure you're, you're buying the right properties at the right price that, that are going to increase over the years. Well, I think that's very sensible advice. I mean, the, the days of thinking if you buy property, you're going to make money are over, aren't they? Really? Yeah. It doesn't just work quite as simply. If you as can that. hold on for 50 years, you'll probably always make money. But you know, if you want to try and make money over the next 5, 10, 15 years, you need to make sure you're, you're buying in the right areas. Yeah, yeah sure. Do you see do you see a lot of foreign investors with your constructions, Dave? Uh, I worked a couple of years ago at Nine Elms when they built the new Northern Line extension down there. And anyone who knows Nine Elms in South London, massive investment around there, high rise blocks. That was all done by a consortium of Malaysian investors. Yeah. I think these foreign investors look at it slightly different to us. They're sitting on humongous amounts of money. That Cash they, reserves, yeah. That they just they need to put somewhere, and and they're investing for the long term. So I, I think London, England has always been attractive to them. And I, I, I know I was a little surprised. I, I mean, there's one or two big Dubai companies that have invested in that area, and I, I was talking to one of them, one of their managing directors, and he said. Uh, I don't care about the sales rate. He said, if we have, if we have to wait five years to get the money, we'll wait. Yeah. You know, it, it's absolutely okay. Don't worry about it. We've you got know. investors from overseas and they will say to us, 
specifically only London they, they don't want to go out with. I think it's just because they, they don't they don't want to do due diligence for other areas. They just know London's a good investment and any any good investments that come up, they'll put their money in. It's a capital city, isn't it? And it, you know, if you wait long enough, it's whatever it happens, it's gonna come right. Yeah. I think that I think that's the key really at the, at the end of the day. Um, I, I, and I, I'm not one of these, I, a lot of people sort of object to foreign investment in property here saying, oh, it takes it out of the reach of young people. And that. I, don't, I don't think it does because the types of property that these big companies are investing in are not the properties that, you know, 20 year olds are going to be buying. They're just, it's just a different market, you know. Um, I, I, I just think we should be more, more open minded. You know, I, I don't even see this argument where people say, oh, it's, it's, it's wrong. These properties are sitting empty and this, that. And well, you know, somebody's invested and they don't want to rent it out. Fine, yeah. don't. <laughs> you know, it doesn't affect anything else, does it really? But there we are. OK, well, as I say, London's the centre of attraction for property a lot of the time. And uh, I think a lot of us think you fall off the end of the world if you go past the M M25. So, so there we are. Dave. I'm considering starting a small residential property development. I've been advised to award the construction contract to a single company who will handle everything to completion. Would I be sensible to pull, appoint my own project manager to oversee the company's activities, although, though, although their contract includes management of the project within the quote? So I suppose, do you have two project managers? I think you're going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's assume that you're not going to be getting involved with it yourself. So before you even engage this construction company, you're going to need someone advising you. And you're still going to be responsible for things like bringing the new utilities in, etc. Mm -hmm. You don't want to leave that to the construction company. So um, once work gets going, you're going to need someone acting on your behalf to go down there, even if it's only once a week, and just check that everything's all right. So from that point of view, yeah, it's worth employing a project manager. I'm always a little bit dubious when I hear that the construction company are going to employ a project manager and a site manager, because when you look at their, their tender, and their breakdown of cost, you'll quite often see something, and I'm talking about London now, so you'll see, right, site manager, £450 a day, and project manager, £600 a week. That project manager is only going to come to site one day a week, and he's probably only going to be there half a day at most. So from that point of view, I would look at it and I think, well, if I'm paying £450 already to have one of these people running this job, why do I want to pay another £600 you know, for this project manager just to stick his head in? Because when at the beginning, when you're negotiating tenders, you're probably dealing with, regarding the size of the company, you're dealing with either the director of the company or the contracts manager. Now, as a client, if I'm giving them half a million pounds worth of work, <coughs> I expect him to be on the end of the phone anyway when I need to speak to him. I don't really, I'm not so keen on, on paying for, for a project manager who's not going to be there. And if he's going to be there, why am I paying additional for the site manager as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I suppose a lot of people who are new to development can't get used to the idea that, um, in effect, when you have a single contractor doing the project, sort of, what do they call it, turnkey operation, um, you actually hand your site over, don't you? Yeah. And it's not really for you to interfere, is it? In fact, they get very cross and... Yeah, you can't yeah. really, no, not, not if it's turnkey, no, you can't. And I mean... I, and then the famous claims book comes out, doesn't it? So, well, you you came on site yesterday and changed all the colours. So it's another how many thousand pounds? Or well, it depends what contracts you use as well. But this is another whole area of construction contracts that people come unstuck on. You know? Yeah. Well, that's that's why I would suggest that at, at the earliest stage of any 
uh, um, development, they w you would employ somebody like yourself, even if you fade out once, once, once it starts. Yeah. But to put you on the right track, to give you the right tools to manage. But and again, that, that's the thing. If you are going to employ a project manager, you got to make sure you're getting the value out of them as well. Like, do you really need, okay, at the beginning, yeah, sure. But do, do you need to be paying someone 400 pounds yeah. per visit if he's only going down there having a little interface meeting with the bloke running the job? So there's the, all these things to be weighed up. Okay. I, th I think how you set the job up, whether it's a twenty thousand pound refurb or a, a million pound job, how you set that job up is going to directly affect your profit. So again, it's set up properly, and whether that's someone that goes down, like you know, you maybe apply the, the architect or a project manager, somebody that represents you to just keep an eye on things. But you really need to get it all set up properly at the yeah. start. Um, you can't be sticking your head in and um, mm. halfway through and having arguments. Okay, gents. Well, look, just in the last couple of minutes of the show, perhaps 30 seconds each, um, Dave, tell me tell me what you see for, for the coming months and the next year or two in terms of construction changes and the future. Is it going to be a tough time? Is it going to be a boom time? Oh, well, I don't know if that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the answer. There's... Well, look, the price of materials has gone down recently, which people would say is good, but it's gone down because there's been a slump in products in projects being started. So that's not good. I don't look. I'm always confident in you know, and for property developers and investors, if you know what you're doing, if you know how to spot a good bargain, and you, you've got the right people with you, you're going to make money. Just do it, Nick. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same. You know, if, if, if you're in property and, and you're doing it full time and you know what you're doing, I mean, I'm never, there's not going to be a time where I'm thinking, oh, the interest rates are a bit high, I'm not going to do this, or probably the construction industry slowed up down a bit. It doesn't change my way of thinking. I do what I do and, and I, I focus on it. Yeah, you need to maybe adjust your strategy slightly, but if you're doing property full time, you know, you just you just roll with the bunches whether the well, interest again, rates are mean, high or you, you mentioned interest rates. It's just a fixed cost, yeah, isn't it? It's, you, it's, you know, it's, it's just a calculation cost. in. All right, gentlemen, um, real big thank you to both of you for coming in today. Really good answers to the questions. Great stuff. Thank you so much. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property question time and again big thank you to Dave Ford Chartered Construction Manager and Nick Hewitt from the Property App. Thank, thank you. you both. Thank you.